So we're going to do procedures now. This is a staple of high-level languages. You do a subroutine call to some other piece of code that maybe you wrote, maybe somebody else wrote, and then return from that call with some result. Uh, this is a classic technique, and we want to walk through how this is done in assembly language because, again, in assembly language, all we got is this machine, and all we got is those few instructions. And so using those few instructions, we have to find some way to jump around to other people's code. MIPS uh, implements this in a couple of different ways. We're going to do the simple way first, which uses registers to pass information back and forth. And then later we'll do the complicated way, which is to use the stack to pass information back and forth. So the idea with procedures is you're breaking your code up into manageable pieces, uh, subroutines, subprograms, functions, methods. There's a lot of different ways of calling this in different high-level languages, but it's a very common technique. And the idea is to be able to reuse code <clears throat> without rewriting code. To be able to run a piece of code more than once in a different way than a loop does without having to write that code multiple times in your memory. So we're going to use a jump instruction to get to a procedure and then we're going to have to find some way to get back to where we started. Jumps, uh, as they are initially produced, uh, just put a new value into the program counter. But we need a special technique to allow us to get back to the old value of the program counter so we can carry on from where we left off. So we're going to invent a new instruction called jump and link. This is going to have two functions. The first function is a jump, just like we talked about before. You're going to get to some new area in memory. And then the and link part is going to, before you actually put a new value in the program counter, you're going to take the current value of the program counter, or at least the value of the program counter after it's been incremented. So you're pointing to the next instruction after the jump. And you're going to store that somewhere so that you can put that back in the program counter after you're done with the subroutine, getting you back where you started from. So it's going to look like this, jump and link to some label. And in your assembly code, that label is going to represent the code that's in your subroutine. And then at the end of the subroutine, you're going to get back to the original code using another special instruction, which we'll look at in a second. So the and link part is what stores the return address. <clears throat> we're going to use a special reserved register called the return address. Where is my, here is my register file. So the register file contains a whole bunch of registers, one special register. In fact, the last register is called the return address, register 31. Uh, this is a special register whose job it is, is to store the program counter when you're calling a subroutine so that you can return <laughs> back to where you started. It's reserved for procedure calls. You're, you're, it's, it's not a good idea to use it for anything other than procedure calls because otherwise you might mess up your return address and you'd never get back where you started. Jump and link is going to store PC plus 4 in the return address. This is, of course, the address of the instruction after the jump instruction. So you don't want to come back to the jump instruction because you just do the jump instruction again. So you come back to the instruction after the jump instruction and then you're there. When you're done a subroutine, you're going to you're going to use that return address to go back to where you started. The way we do this is with jump register. Jump register is an instruction we introduced earlier, which allows you to put the contents of a register into the program counter. This one, we're going to use the contents of the return address, put it back in the program counter, and that's going to get us back where we started. So every procedure call will start with JAL. That's a jump and link to get you to the procedure. And then every procedure call will end with JRRA, which is a jump register using the return address to get you back where you started. This is what it looks like in code. We have a, your regular code or you're proceeding through doing whatever you're doing. Maybe you'll set up some uh, arguments, which we'll talk about in a second. Then jump and link to the procedure will put a new value in the program counter. It does two things. It puts a new value in the program counter, and it also puts the return address into the return address register. So, we're going to go to here. <clears throat> this procedure is a label in your assembly code or in some other assembly code. And you're going to do some stuff. And then when you're done doing that stuff, you're going to JRRA, which will get you back to where you started. That's the basics of a procedure call. But a procedure is not very good unless you can pass information back and forth. You can give information to the procedure and then pass information back from the procedure to the main program. And so this is uh, going to be accomplished using what we call arguments and return values. 
Uh, this is, again, in a high-level language, a pretty standard procedure. We use an argument to get information into a procedure, and then a return value to get information back from the procedure. So as an example, in a high-level language, you might call a procedure, say, absolute value of n, right? That n is a piece of information we're going to send to the procedure, and the procedure is going to return the result. <clears throat> in MIPS, we can do this in a couple different ways. Uh, we can do memory, which is what we will eventually use, uh, in a higher level way, <clears throat> and there are uh, stack procedures and stuff we'll look at in a second, um, but the basic way to do this is with registers. We have a set of standard registers that are actually used conventionally for putting information back and forth from procedures. We're going to use these registers to pass information from what we call the caller. The caller contains the jump and link to the callee, which is the subroutine or piece of code that will receive the information from the caller, produce some new result, pass it back to the callee, uh, pass it back to the caller. <clears throat> so the basic way we do this is the caller is going to place some information in a known register that both the caller and the callee agree to. If they don't know if <laughs> if the different procedures don't know which re which register to use, then we can't find that information or pass it back and forth. So we're going to agree to certain information being in certain registers. The callee is going to assume that that register has the desired value. The callee is going to produce some result and put that again in an agreed upon register that the caller is going to look at after it's done. The problem, of course, is which registers do we use? How do we agree on which registers to use? Well, we already have some sort of basic protocol for this using the uh, syscall. When we do a syscall, um, if we look at the way that syscall is set up, uh, we put some information in a particular register, the V register, and that tells the syscall what we are asking it to do. And then we can also put some information in other registers, depending on which kind of a syscall we're doing, that can either pass information to or retrieve information from um, uh, the syscall procedures. So this is already an agreed upon location for putting information to call and return. In regular subroutines, in user-defined subroutines that you're going to write, there are a set of standard registers that we're going to use. <clears throat> we are going to use um, A registers for arguments. We're going to use V registers for return values. These are the first two, uh, so 0 and 1 are reserved, special registers. After that, the next registers are your return values, 2 and 3, which is V0 and V1 and your arguments, which are 4, 5, 6, 7, which is A0 through A3. So you put some data into an A register, and then you return data via a V register. <clears throat> when you are in the midst of a procedure, um, it's important to remember which registers you're allowed to change and which registers you shouldn't change. If you call a procedure in a high-level language, you don't expect the argument that you send to it to actually change. You expect that argument to stay the same, unless you're using pass by reference, but we're not going to talk about that yet, perhaps later on. So if you pass a value to a procedure, you expect the value you pass to stay unchanged, but then the return value should be modified. And so this is in fact what we do. The, the return values we expect to be the same. The arguments, oh, sorry, the return values we expect to change the arguments we expect to stay the same. So when we send an argument to a procedure, we expect that argument will not change. The return values, we expect they will change. And so we have another column here that says save. And this is whether or not a value will be should be saved within the context of a procedure call. So if you're writing a procedure call and you decide that for some reason you need to mess with the A registers, this column says you need to save them before you do that somewhere so that you can retrieve them so that when you're done, the A registers don't change. The return values should change, so you don't need to save them. That's why that says no. So variable registers V can be used within procedures. The caller is not going to assume that they are going to stay the same. Right? We're going to assume that they might change. So anytime you call a procedure, a V register is fair game. It could change within the course of that procedure. An A register should not change within the course of that procedure. You can put information in an A register and be confident that at the end of your procedure, that information will not have changed. 
So A registers are stable, um, and V registers are not, right? <clears throat> the other registers in the register file also now need to consider whether or not they are considered stable or not, right? Just like the A registers and the V registers, all the other registers in our register file, we're going to have to now think about and say, should we expect them to be saved or not? And in fact, we're going to put them into two categories. We're going to have temporary registers, T, and saved registers, S. These are the registers we have been using so far, but we haven't really known why they're called temporary or saved. Temporary registers are just like return values. We do not expect them to stay the same. If you have information in a T register and you're going to call a subroutine, you'd better put it somewhere because it may not be the same when you get back from the subroutine. Saved registers, S, are expected to be the same during subroutine calls. So if you have information in an S register and you call a subroutine, you can be sure that by when you, the subroutine returns, that information has not changed. And we have this note in the uh, register file that tells us whether these registers are are saved across a uh, subroutine or are not saved across a subroutine. So they're, they are protected in a subroutine, they're not protected in a subroutine. And we look at the stack pointer, frame pointer, global pointer return address. These also should be expected not to change during a subroutine. We don't know what the first three are, but if you think about what a return address is, if you call a subroutine and the return address changes, that's a problem because you can't then get back from that procedure call. So yes, we expect return addresses to be consistent across a subroutine call. So variables and variables in temporary are what we call caller saved. If you have a value in a V register or a T register and you're going to call a subroutine, then if you want that value in the V register or T register to be preserved, it's your responsibility to save it before you call the subroutine. A and S registers are callee saved. If you are in a subroutine and you want to mess with an A register or an S register, it's your responsibility inside the subroutine to save it before you mess with it and retrieve it before you return from the subroutine. So it just depends on the, the onus of the uh, preservation of the information in the register is either on the caller for V and T or on the callee for A and S. And again, that information is on the sheet. So this is the basic way that we do subroutine calls. You put some information into an A register, you, you do uh, JAL, and then within the subroutine you uh, do some whatever you want to do, you put a result back in a V register, and then you do JRRA, and that gets you back. But as you might have already predicted, there is a problem with this, and that is you can't do nested subroutines. Once you've called a subroutine, the return address contains the value you need to get back, and you can't mess with it. You can't change it by calling another subroutine. Either you have to save that in another register, in which case you're going to run out of registers really quickly, or we have to do something else. And so in the next set of videos, we'll look at some higher level details of more general procedures for calling subroutines. Register parameters and arguments and return values for subroutines is good enough for most simple subroutines that do not require nested subroutines and do not require more than four arguments or two return values. And so for most subroutines, that's fine. In general, though, we'll need a few more details, and that's what the next videos will give us.